I want to start with thanking the one person that's responsible for today's announcement, and that's President Trump. He's been steadfast in his commitment to lowering the cost of drugs and protecting the Medicare program and making sure it works best for seniors. The President also knows that it's the free market that leverages competition and negotiation, that that is what can lower cost and improve quality for the American patient. And because of that, we've been working to slash Medicare's anti-competitive regulations, and it's worked. In the Medicare Part D program, as the President said, we are seeing low premiums, a seven-year low. And in the Medicare Advantage program, we're seeing a 13-year low in premiums. So we're putting money back in the pockets of seniors. And that means $3 billion in savings for patients and $6 billion in savings for taxpayers. And in absence of a congressional solution, we applied those same principles to lowering the cost of insulin. We are waiving Obamacare laws that disincentivize plans from lowering cost sharing for our Medicare beneficiaries. And this is important because we know that beneficiaries struggle to pay their insulin costs. It's patients like Cindy from Rochester, New York. She told us that the high cost of insulin has impacted her health and that she's been forced to ration her insulin. She said, I know that it's not good at all for my health and I'm sure that I've affected some organs negatively because of that lack of money to purchase insulin. But no longer, thanks to the President's leadership, Medicare seniors will pay no more than $35 for their insulin, and that's per month, and that's for all forms of insulin through all phases of the Medicare Part D program. I also will say that some plans are free to even go below the $35, um, and so they could even see lower premiums as well. I'm also proud to say that we have over 88 health plans that are participating in this model, and that represents over 1,750 plans that will offer this low-cost insulin. These plans will be available uh, during this year's open enrollment, which starts in October. And I want to thank the manufacturers and the health plans for stepping up to the plate, for coming together to negotiate this great senior savings model. It's going to make such a difference to the lives of many seniors across the country. And I am optimistic that this could be a model to lower the cost of many other drugs in the Medicare program. And thank you again, President Trump, for bringing lower cost priced insulin. Our seniors are going to be saving an average of 66% in their insulin cost. And this is nothing short of a godsend. Thank you. Uh, John, please. Mr. President, uh, can you tell us what you plan to do regarding sanctions against China for its pending actions against Hong Kong? And do you also intend to put restrictions on F and J visas for students and researchers coming into the United okay. States from China? Uh, your questions early, we're doing it now. We're doing something now. I think you'll find it very interesting, but I won't be talking about it today. I'll be talking about it over the next couple of days, John. Okay? But it's a very important question. Yes, please. Anybody? Yeah, please. Mr. President, two questions about uh, a couple of things you've tweeted about in the last few days. Uh, were you meaning to criticize Vice President Biden for wearing a mask yesterday? And can you explain why you've been tweeting about a conspiracy theory that has been proven to not be true? No, Biden can wear a mask, but he was standing uh, outside with his wife, perfect conditions, perfect weather. They're inside, they don't wear masks. And so I thought it was very unusual that he had one on. But I thought that was fine. I wasn't criticizing him at all. Why would I ever do a thing like that? And uh, your second question was, I couldn't hear you. The can, second you can you take it off? Because I cannot hear I'll, you. I'll just speak louder, sir. Oh, this, okay, good. You want to be politically correct. Go ahead. No, sir, I just want to wear go the mask. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the second question was about your tweets about the, the woman who died, who you're suggesting that Joe Scarborough was responsible. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that. And uh, hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Very sad and very suspicious. Uh, question, please. I asked you not to tweet, tweet ahead, about please, it anymore, go. sir. Mr. President, though, have you seen the letter that was written uh, by her husband begging Twitter to, to 
delete your tweets, talking about how hard it's been for his family, for him yeah, to I deal have, with but that. But I'm sure that ultimately they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. I also saw a uh, clip with, uh, with Joe and Imus, uh, where they were having a lot of fun at her expense, and I thought it was totally inappropriate. Now, it's a very suspicious thing, and uh, I hope somebody gets to the bottom of it. It'll be a very good thing. As you know, there's no statute of limitations. So it would be a very good, uh, very good thing to do. Okay, who's next? Any questions on insulin? Yeah, please. Mr. President, there's a bill in Congress that would, uh, that's related to the Uyghurs. It passed the Senate, it's gonna be up in the House. Are you, are you willing to sign that? We're taking a look at it very strongly. They're gonna report this afternoon. I'll be looking at it this afternoon. Something special that you mentioned on China, does that include sanctions no, it's, or does uh, that? it's uh, something you're going to be hearing about over the next, before the end of the week, very powerfully, I think. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason why someone who does not have diabetes would take insulin? Is there any sort of medical reason for that? I could ask that question to anybody like to discuss that. Do you want to discuss it? Please, go ahead. Do you know the answer? Either one of you or both. Come on, let's get these. Highly paid executives up here to give the answer. Seema? Please, Jerome. We picked a good one. We got it right. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And I think it's important for everyone to know that as uh, Tracy Brown highlighted earlier, one in three Americans is actually either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And I would encourage folks to go to uh, diabetes.org slash risk, uh, risk dash test. So diabetes.org slash risk dash test to uh, find out if you are at risk for diabetes. As far as insulin goes, we know that again, seven million people actually are dependent on insulin. We know that from a type one diabetes standpoint, 1.6 million Americans have type one diabetes and most all of them are dependent on insulin. Your body, Mr. President, actually makes insulin endogenously and people such as uh, you and I we make our own insulin so yes we do utilize insulin but we make it ourselves uh. other people who have diabetes oftentimes need exogenous insulin made by many of these great manufacturers here so that they can be healthy and live long and successful lives and make no mistake about it if they can get affordable insulin they can live a long and healthy life. And that's what we're here for today. Today is a very important day. It is a monumental day because, Tracy, we've been working for years to try to address the price of insulin, for years. This is an important day, and I want to thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank all the people here for making that insulin affordable to more people. Thank you very much. And, uh, Tracy, do you agree with that? And, uh the question I found to be a very interesting one, but uh, is that an unusual question or an unusual circumstance? Right. Okay, good. I thought it was a very good question, actually. Uh, please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. We see in Europe slowly from uh, one country to the other, they are opening their borders and letting people going from uh, uh, moving from one country to the other. Are you considering, for the good of the U.S. economy, are you considering uh, lifting the uh, flight ban from Europe in the next weeks? Well, we're just putting a ban on, as you know, going on immediately, essentially, almost immediately, to Brazil and from Brazil into our country. So from Brazil to the United States, they're having a very hard time in Brazil. Uh, we'll be doing uh, certain announcements on other countries, including Europe, uh, as we move along and uh, where they're making progress, we'll start to open it up, but only where they're making progress. They're making some good progress. I think we're making very good progress. We're making very good progress on the economy. The numbers are better than anybody would have anticipated. And certainly, I think that's been reflected in the stock market, which had a very big day, and it's over 25,000. And when you think 25,000 is a very high number, when you think that it was at uh, 29,000, uh, and now it's at 25. That's a very big day. It's up very substantially over the last six months. So uh, we had a very big day. But people are seeing what's happening. They're seeing there is a pent-up demand, as I was predicting. And you're going to see it more and more. We call it the transition to greatness, and it really is. We're going to have a third quarter that's going to be good. 
We're going to have a fourth quarter that has the potential to be really good, and we're going to have the best year, one of the best years we've ever had next year. That's what we see. Yeah, John, go ahead. Mr. President, is it your intention to bring American forces home from Afghanistan by Thanksgiving Day, and is the Pentagon drawing up plans to that effect? Well, I think everyone knows we're down to uh, less than 8,000 troops. Uh, we're uh, with uh, leadership in many different fields and in many different parts of, of that country. We're with uh, — we're dealing with the Taliban. We're dealing with the President. The President now has gotten themselves straightened out with the two Presidents. But we're dealing with — because they had, as you know, they had competing factors and factions. Uh, yeah, I think we want to get — we're there 19 years. We're really not acting as soldiers. We're acting as police. And we're not sent over there to be policemen. But we're there 19 years. And, uh, yeah, I think that's enough. And uh, they understand. We're having uh, very positive talks. We want to bring our soldiers back home. We want to bring them back home. And uh, we're not only talking about there. We're talking about other countries also. We bring our soldiers back home. We can always go back if we have to. If we have to go back, we'll go back, and we'll go back raging. And then we'll go back as warriors, fighters. But right now, we're policing. And we're not meant to be a police force. We're meant to be a fighting force. Is Thanksgiving Day the target? No, I have no target, but as soon as reasonable. Over a period of time, but as soon as reasonable. We're down to 7,000-some-odd soldiers right now. And in Iraq, we're down to 4,000 soldiers. So we're making a lot of progress. In Syria, you remember, John, on the border, when I took the soldiers out of the border, everyone said, oh, that's so terrible. Well, I spoke to President Erdogan yesterday of Turkey. The border's been fine without us. They've been policing that border for 2,000 years. All of a sudden, we had thousands of soldiers there doing their work. For what? Guarding Syria and Turkey on a border, a very long border? No, we want our troops back home. Uh, we took them out. That was a year ago. I was criticized. Nothing happened, except they're watching their own borders now. We kept the oil, but at some point, we'll take care of the Kurds with respect to the oil and get out. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Mr. President, quickly, on your meeting with Governor Cuomo tomorrow. Yeah, he's can, coming in. Can you say what you're going to be discussing? Do you have a particular agenda? Do you think you'll discuss the Gateway Project, the the, the Hudson River I would Tunnel imagine Project. we would, but he uh, he asked for the meeting, so we'll see what he wants. But he asked for the meeting. Governor Cuomo, and we'll be coming in uh, sometime tomorrow. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, what can you tell us about the documents reportedly declassified by Rick Grinnell just before he stepped down as DNI? Are you prepared to release the transcript of the Flynn Kislyak conversations? Yeah, I'd like to hear it too. I mean, I'd like to hear it. The FBI, as you know, said that he didn't lie. And certainly, the conversation, almost regardless, it was a good conversation. He was allowed to do it. And uh, the Mueller people, who are uh, — have been proven <laughs> very bad, very bad things they did, very bad things. A lot of bad things are being found out about the hoax. Greatest hoax in the, in the history of our country. And it was an illegal hoax and a very dangerous hoax. And a lot of bad things have been found out about Mueller and the gang. So I would like to hear that conversation. Yeah, I would like to hear it personally. So whatever they want me to do, I'll do. I think Rick Grinnell has done an incredible job. And things are happening now that uh, I always knew. This was the answer. This was a, a — an attempted coup by a bunch of dirty cops and others. These are dirty cops, dishonest slime bags. All right. Yeah, question. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, on Friday, you announced that you wanted governors to reopen churches and synagogues and mosques, and you said you would overrule them if they, if they declined to do so. Can you explain what authority you had in mind when you said that you would do that? I can absolutely do it if I want to, and I don't think I'm going to have to because it's starting to open up. We need our churches and our synagogues and our mosques. We want them open. Churches, synagogues, mosques, and other we want them open, and we want them open as soon as possible. Now, I can tell you, I know a lot of pastors, a lot of rabbis, imams, and they, they want to take care of their people. They want to take care. They don't want anyone getting uh, hurt or, or sick, and they're going to take care of their people. We need, we need these people. We need, we need people that are going to be leading us in faith, and we're opening them up. 
And if I have to, I will override any governor that wants to play games. If they want to play games, that's okay. But we will win. And we have many different ways where I can override them. And if I have to, I'll do that. But we want our churches and our synagogues and our mosques, etc. We want them open. Now, there may be some areas, by the way, where the pastor or whoever may feel that it's not quite ready. And that's okay. That's okay. But let that be the choice of the congregation and the pastor. John, go ahead. Mr. President, how long will you give North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper to provide you with the information that you and the RNC are asking for before you decide to look elsewhere for a venue for the RNC convention in August? Well, as you know, we don't have much time because we have to know that if we're going to spend millions of dollars on an arena, we want to be in North Carolina. I love North Carolina. I won North Carolina. We just had a big two races that we won recently for Congress in North Carolina. Two very big races that the press didn't want to report on. If we would have lost them, it would have been the biggest story in political history. But we just won two races. It's a very important place to me. I love North Carolina. In fact, my son, Eric, and Laura named a baby Carolina and came from, I think, both. But she was born in North Carolina, as you know, Laura. So it's a very important place to me. Uh, but at the same time, and I think the people understand this, we have a governor that doesn't want to open up the state. And we have a date of August, in the end of August. And we have to know before we spend millions and millions of dollars on an arena to make it magnificent for the convention, and we have tremendous people. I mean, the economic development consequences are tremendous for the state. We have to know that when the people come down, they're going to have the doors open. Now, if the governor can't tell us very soon, unfortunately, we'll have no choice. This has nothing to do with us. This is between the governor and North Carolina and the people of North Carolina. But the people want it, and we'll have to see whether or not the governor — now, he's a Democrat, and a lot of the Democrats, for political reasons, don't want to open up their states. So we'll see if that works, but I don't think it will. I'd love to have it in North Carolina. That was why I chose it, Charlotte. But we're going to see. We're going to see. And at the end, we need a fast decision from the governor. He's going to have to — because he's, he's been acting very, very slowly and very suspiciously, but we'll find out. All right, question, please. So, what's, so in terms of soon, are we talking a week, two well, we weeks, need, a month? Yeah, I mean, we can't take — we're talking about a very short period of time. It's a massive expenditure, and we have to know, yeah, I would say within a week. That certainly we have to know. Now, if he can't do it, if he feels that he's not going to do it, all he has to do is tell us, and then we'll have to pick another location. And I will tell you, a lot of locations want it. But I picked North Carolina because I do love that state, and it would have been a perfect place for it, and it still would be. But he's got to say that, you know, when thousands of people come to the arena, that they'll be able to get in. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, we'll spend uh, millions and millions of dollars on this magnificent design. But in the end, they have to be able to get in. I don't want to have it where we get there and then they announce, after all the money was spent, all the work was done, all the people travel in, guess what? You can't put anybody in the arena. Or you can put a tiny number of people in the arena. We can't do that, John. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Um, there are now more than — still more than a dozen states in this country where case numbers are rising. So why is it suspicious if a governor says, look, we don't want to move that — that quickly? We still think we need to shut down. Oh, I think it's fine. They have to do it. Look, the governors, in certain ways, have to do what they want to do. But they have to tell me what they're doing. And when it comes to churches, et cetera, they will be overridden by me. When it comes to other things, and, you know, many other things, they won't. If I think something's being done incorrectly or wrong, I'm going to do it. But you have different governors, and they have very different views on where they are and where they're going. So we'll see what happens. Please, go ahead. I'm sure, I'm sure you saw the images from over the weekend of people out on Memorial Day weekend. They were crowding pools, crowding boardwalks. Do you have any message for those people? Yeah, always be safe. You want to be safe. We're opening up, but you want to be safe. Go ahead, please. Thank you. About mail-in voting, you've been — you've been speaking out against a lot uh, — against that you a lot. You mean mail-in voting? Yeah. Not you, you've been speaking a lot of, um, about that. Yeah. Uh, what, why should somebody who is afraid of getting coronavirus going to public places, standing in a line, et cetera, why should they First not — First of all, yeah. Why should they not be allowed to do mail-in? Well, that's going to be in a long time from now, number one. You know, it's quite a ways away, number one. But uh, when you do uh, all mail-in voting ballots, 
you're asking for fraud. People steal them out of mailboxes. People print them, and then they sign them, and they give them in. And the people don't even know where they're double-counted. People take them away. They force people to vote. They harvest. You know what harvesting is? They take many, many ballots, and they put them all together, and then they just dump them, and nobody has any idea whether they're crooked or not. Look, you do mail-in voting. Now, it's another thing to do absentee voting. Or if somebody has a medical condition where they go through a process and they get an absentee ballot, that's okay. That's different. But in California, the governor sent, I hear, or is sending millions of ballots all over the state, millions, to anybody, to anybody. People that aren't citizens, illegals, anybody that walks in California is going to get a ballot. We're not going to destroy this country by allowing things like that to happen. We're not destroying our country. This has more to do with fairness and honesty, and really, our country itself. Because when that starts happening, you don't have a, a fair — you have a rigged system. You have a rigged system, and that's what would happen. So mail-in ballots — and the governor of California did better than any — that I could ever do in terms of explaining. When he sent out, or will send out — and I don't know, I think it's maybe partially already done — millions and millions of ballots to anybody in California that's walking or breathing, Many of those people don't have the right to vote. Well, they'll be voting. And you know what? We're not going to let it happen, because you're subverting our, our process, and you're making our country a joke. And the Democrats are doing it because, in theory, it's good for them. Although, last week, we won two big races. We won in Wisconsin and one in California. California, 25. We won a, a tremendous race in California. That was that was interesting, because at the end of the race, they brought in the Democrats — Democrat governor, same governor — he brought in voting booths, not mail-in voting booths, because they were losing. They saw that through the ballots. But, no, you can't do that. You can't do the mail-in ballots, because you're going to have tremendous fraud. And remember what I said. They'll be grabbing them from mailboxes. They'll even be printing them. They'll use the same paper, the same machines, and they'll be printing ballots illegally. And they'll be sending them in by the hundreds of thousands, and nobody's going to know the difference. We can't do that. You want to vote? You really have to. Absentee is okay. You're sick. You're away. As an example, I have to do an absentee because I'm voting in Florida, and I happen to be president. I live in that very beautiful house over there that's painted white. So that's okay. And it's okay for people that are sick and they can't get up. Something, you know, something. But voting is a great honor. It's a great honor. And people love to go out and vote. And I want to keep it that way. And if we don't keep it that way, we'll have nothing but a rigged system in this country. We can't do that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.